Traders, welcome to Institutional Sunday. Fantastic session for you today, judging by, look for yourself, this chart um, that I have in front of me. Forex versus equity. So before you decide whether to stick around or not, you know, you might be thinking, hey, I don't trade equities. Doesn't matter. Look at this, right? Look at the correlation between Forex and equities um, in the recent past, right? Let's actually stop and pray, right? I'm not religious, but let's spare a thought for those trading Forex using, and I don't even have the word for it anymore, random percentage bounces, moving averages, and I don't even know, right? The words for all that crap. And that's probably being polite, because obviously I don't want to swear, but yeah. You know, I see all these price action and lines and jumps and moving average strategies and cobblers, never heard so much rubbish in my life, right? You don't even need to take my word for it. Look at this, the correlation between Forex and equities, which we're going to talk about today in Institutional Sundays. Um, you can even see the rolling correlation here, right? This is what is going to make you money in Forex, right? Whether you're trading Forex or equities, it doesn't matter. And I've always said that. Um, Institutional Sundays is for everyone, no matter what asset class you're trading, even Bitcoin and Cryptos are all correlated to equities, and today I've only got time to talk about Forex, but um, again, let's spare a second thought for those, because I see so many of them, these, you know, strategy A, B, C, best only strategy needed for Forex, and you know, this support resistance line and supply demand, and I don't even know, right? <laughs> it's hilarious, and the worrying thing is some of them have got like hundreds of thousands of views and all of that, so it's just, I don't know, whereas today, I'm going to show you that all of that is complete cobblers and actually um, you need to be looking at if not the stuff that I show in Institutional Sundays at least order flow order flow that's driving markets in whole order flow that's driving obviously foreign exchange if that's what you're looking at but it's all interrelated and that's my point and that's what I'm going to show here we're also going to talk about um, just very briefly returns as I always do so that's this week's returns. Um, been okay, similar to last week where I did about 3K this week. Um, had a decent Friday, um, so ended up 3.5K. And actually, if you we just look at month to date, um, just jumped over 20K yesterday just because I ended up with a strong day. So even though you know I've been a little bit cautious, as you can see, over the last couple of weeks as we've got to all-time highs, which I called, right, many times, if you go back, watch all the Institutional Sundays, I've always said the market is too cheap on the retracement, we're going back to all-time highs, which has now happened. Things get a little bit more interesting now. Point is, um, we'll briefly talk about, um, obviously, the stats, and we're going to go through some of, in fact, all of the trades this week that I've taken, because I know some of my students like to look at that, just to kind of have some benchmark or references that they can compare against. So, let's get into it. So anyway, back to this um, chart here, Forex versus equities, right? Here, a lot of people saying, hey, you know, I don't trade equities, so I don't want to look at the stuff you're looking at. Complete and utter cobblers, as I've said. C can you even tell the difference? Which one is which here? No, because they're moving exactly the same, right? So this is actually the S&P, and this is um, GBPUSD, so cable um, versus um, equity, so S&P 500. Look at the correlation, right? Recently, the S&P has been going back to all-time highs and it's dragged cable with it, okay? This is how markets work, okay? Money is looking for a home. It's looking for high-yielding investments and ultimately, um, money has been looking in equities and in high-yielding currencies at the same time, which is obviously um, quite normal because obviously you want to diversify if you're going to be putting money into... Um, risky uh, assets um, and obviously things like the pound, the Aussie, um, New Zealand dollar, um, those type of things are going to be bought and obviously things like yen are going to be sold um, and that's what we're seeing here, right? So I'm going to show you just the next slide which actually shows you the actual correlations um, in S&P uh, versus cable, so GBP USD, okay? So no excuses for looking at junk anymore, okay? This, don't need to take my word for it. How can you, you can't argue with facts, right? If you're delud delusional, if you're going to argue with facts, then obviously, you know, you're on your own, right? Carry on then. I mean, you know, good luck. But if you want to actually 
learn about how markets um, are actually driven, whether that is equities, like I said, or you're looking at Forex or whatever it is you're looking at, you need to understand that every market is driven by the same stuff that is driving equities and this is basically categorical evidence of that. And we're not just talking mild correlation, right? We're talking major correlation, right? I'm, I'm not talking a few months. I'm talking this is going back 15 years, okay? Okay, guys, you've got, got to understand this is um, a correlation that stands the test of time. So we're talking numbers here of 80%. 80% correlation, right, between S&P and GBP USD. And you want to ignore that? Big, big problems you've got, okay? So anyway, look, I'm not here to kind of um, put a downer on anything or obviously try and put anyone off. In fact, the opposite. I'm trying to help you. So all I'm saying is, you know, take that information on board, stop looking at junk and start looking at the real stuff. So let's get on with the real stuff. So as ever, um, we're going to just have a very brief week in review. And then I've got an amazing session today. Try and keep it quite short. But I'm going to look at the things that have been driving the market recently, which I've spoken about a lot. But obviously, again, it was earnings again um, last week. This last week, we had about, I think we had about 100 companies reporting. Something like, I think it was 10, right? I can't remember the exact stats. But out of 99, 89 beat. Um, their estimates in terms of their earnings and they beat them by a wide margin. I think it was like 10, 12 percent. I don't even know how I remember all these numbers, but I could be wrong. We're going to go and have, actually have a look because I've written them down on the slide. Um, but that's basically what's driven markets, right? This week we're up again 1.6 percent. I think last week was um, just slightly more, around 2 percent. So market has basically wiped out all of its losses in September now and we're well up hit all-time highs, um, right, on Thursday, I believe it was, and essentially, it was driven by all the things that I said it would be driven by, earnings. And do you remember, if you look at last week's Institutional Sunday, I said the data calendar's dead, right? Don't worry about the housing data at the start of the week. We had housing data, which I believe was well under estimates. And I even said the market's just going to ignore it, and what did it do? ignored it okay the market was not interested in that it was interested in obviously earnings that were coming out um, thick and fast throughout the week like I said 99 hundred companies out of 500 reporting almost 20 percent um, so that was what was driving the market early part of the week right up Monday up Tuesday you know typically Tuesday is turnaround Tuesday forget it no turnaround this Tuesday Wednesday up Thursday, ah, amazing claims number again, very, very low claims number, which only helped the matter. And then Friday was just kind of flat, obviously, as the market just kind of consolidated. Um, and basically, as we're going to see with my fills, bought the market, bought the market, bought the market, bought the market. Um, and in fact, I only traded three days, so I can't remember. We, I think I skipped one of these days where it just gapped. I think it may have been Tuesday. So, But the point is, when I did trade, I bought the market. I had a little sell here, very, very nervous I was, but managed it um, and then bought it back there. So I'm going to show you that later, but ultimately that's what drove the week was earnings. OK, and we're even going to talk about what I think will drive next week. Um, but coming back to this week, earnings. So why were earnings driving the market so high? Well, let's look at the facts. Right? I'm interested in facts here um, because we have them now. The week's over. Right. As I said, 99 companies reported 20 percent. Um, so a big week. Right. The first week, if you remember, the week before was financials. We now had a whole bunch of other sectors coming in and reporting and they were equally as um, positive in terms of their earning surprises. Right. So I think I said 12, 13 percent. So 13.3 percent in terms of the Q3 EPS surprise so far. Um, you can see that here. Right. So average, I believe this is a 15 year average, um, 5.21. I think the five year average is slightly higher than that, maybe about six or seven percent. But the point is, earning surprise is way above historical norms. Right. So and we can see that here. So what else is there to say? Earnings smashed it. Obviously, the market reacted positively. 75% um, also beat their revenue numbers. So again, very, very strong number. I mean, I might, my head might be, I can't actually see where my head is, but I might be covering this, I apologize. But next week, right, 
and we have 173 companies reporting. So clearly next week is going to be another big week, right? And think about it. If you actually think about what happened um, coming into October, September, there was no earnings reports. October, all of a sudden, Q3 earnings season has started. The markets turned around. Seasonals were positive. There you go. Okay. In one sentence, you've basically got what's happened over the last couple of months. Earnings have come in, saved the day, and we're back at all-time highs. And that's why these earnings reports are very, very important. So next week, we've got, I believe, um, the big four tech companies. I've got it written down here. Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Amazon, and Facebook. So the five um, largest S&P companies, and they make up 22% of the S&P. Okay, so this week, coming in, as in next week, sorry, um, massive week. Okay, so keep an eye on those earnings. I suspect that could be a catalyst for us to um, keep the market supported. Um, obviously, how much higher we go, I don't know, but it could be a catalyst for us to be supported. I'm going to talk a little bit about what to expect next week. Now, just one more thing on earnings before we move on. This is obviously Q3, okay? Um, EPS and even guidance, right, has a think for some of the companies remaining has even been pushed up recently to buy around 10%. So even guidance is up. But more importantly, um, Q4 earnings, EPS is now up in terms of estimates, right? But also the next 12 months estimates have now been pushed forward, uh, 12 months. No surprise, right, with this, um, you know, 89 out of 99, 18, 89 out of 99 beating estimates. Is it any surprise that analysts are now starting to push up their estimates for Q4 even and beyond? Why is that important? Well, just obviously like to depict that in a chart, one chart for you here, which you can see forward EPS, right? Absolute driver of the markets. Interest rates, because obviously that will determine the discount rate used in the valuation models by um, analysts and then um, earnings. Absolute number one driver, in my opinion, of the S&P, and we can see that here. Right, very strong correlation between um, forward EPS and um, the S&P, right? So not much else to be said there. Let's move on to the other driver that I talked about during the week, which was um, claims, right? So let's get straight into that. Um, so the number, I believe I've got it uh, here, 290,000, right? Um, unemployment claims so really starting to um, make a move down and um, this is the four week average I believe um, 320k so that's obviously starting to be pushed down now um, pre-pandemic average was 241,000 okay so we've got a little bit to go but you can see we're really aggressively um, starting to head in the right direction now to me the market has been making a lot of this as being a great thing and I do agree, don't get me wrong, obviously this is very, very positive and a heavy leading indicator of, you know, kind of economic activity in terms of companies and obviously because if less people are claiming, they're more likely to be going back into work. The problem is, if you actually look at the um, labour force participation rate, which I'm going to show you in a second, um, people might be claiming less, but they're not necessarily getting back into work. And that is where there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect, um, which you can see here. Labor force participation rate, okay? So this is the number of people available to work. Um, obviously we know um, people were stuck indoors and you know, for whatever reason, they weren't able to get into work. So we saw the labor force participation rate um, drop off. But since the pandemic has started to ease in terms of restrictions and obviously um, well, I was going to say infection rates, but obviously that's that's still up in the air. We've got this new Delta variant now. But point is that since we've had the easing of restrictions, the participation rate still hasn't really got back anywhere near to where it needs to be, which is one of the issues, obviously, at the moment. Um, you know, companies are saying that they've got problems in terms of having the number of people that they need to get goods out uh, to meet demand. And then number two is inflation and that's the thing i really want to talk about in today's infl uh, institutional sunday because i've talked a lot about labor shortages and issues with that 
But the problem is, obviously, with this labor participation rate being so low, um, it means that companies have to pay the people who do come to work or to attract staff higher wages. And what does that do? Drives inflation and in turn um, drives the interest rate expectations right up or you know in terms of what the uh, fed are going to be doing so let's actually have a look at that because i think it's going to be really really important going into um, 2022 this is probably in my opinion going to be the most important um, chart going into the rest of 2021 to an extent i think earnings will obviously be very very important as well but Going into 2022, this to me is going to be the number one chart that most people are going to be looking at. The 10 year um, treasury rate, even the short end, you know, like the two year rate, um, looking at the curve, obviously in terms of recently it's been steepening, but now it started to flatten. So um, the two tens um, curve, which is the uh, two year versus the 10 year, has really started to go up at the short end is started to flatten. Why is that? Because interest rate expectations are now starting to really motor ahead. Okay, and we're going to have a look at that. And part of that is why? Because of this inflationary issues. Okay, um, you know, people having to be paid more, the price of goods going up, as we know, so many supply chain issues, um, driving inflation, obviously, easy monetary policy as well is starting to now um, impact prices so many things as we know companies are not able to make enough goods so what happens the prices go up we know this right we're seeing this everywhere the price of i just went to the supermarket the other day prices of things are going crazy and half of them aren't even on the shelves right transportation issues so the market is slowly starting to become concerned about this okay you know the fed have talked about inflation being transitory Right now, it's anything but transitory, and I've said that in all my institutional Sundays, that inflation is going to be a cause for concern, okay? For now, the equity market has brushed it aside, and I even said that that would happen because we're still historically at relatively low level of rates, you know, 1.66. It's still very, very low levels of um, rates. You're talking about having to get up towards above 3% um, before, historically anyway, Treasury rates have had any kind of negative impact on equity. So we've still got a little bit of way to go, but let's not, you know, be complacent here. Point is the trajectory is up. Okay, so what will be interesting in 2022 is how far up do treasury rates go? Do they go up enough to start to create a headwind um, for equities? So let's have a look very briefly. So from uh, my research, what i've been noticing is that the market so historically right the 10-year rate does tend to converge somewhat with where the federal fund rate ends up right and market expectations or market participants. so basically the new york fed right they do this survey um, and they ask various um market participants where do they think you know the federal funds rate will end up so as we've seen historically, these three things do tend to com converge, i.e. the 10-year rate, where market participants think the 10-year rate is going to end up, and the rate itself. So federal funds rate is obviously the um, interest rate that the um, FOMC or the Federal Reserve set, right? Um, it's at the repo rate for banks to use to, obviously, uh, we won't get into that, but it's basically the central bank rate. So we can see here, um, that market participants um, have it basically ending somewhere around uh, 2% and the Federal Reserve on average, on average amongst the federal governors or when they are surveyed have it slightly higher, right? And we can kind of see that here, okay? So here you can see the actual federal funds rate right now. Um, what is the projection of where um, the Federal Reserve think it's going to be um, going into 2022 and then 2023 and then what are market rate expectations so I believe um, the market is actually much more hawkish or um, you could say bullish on rates bullish is not necessarily a good thing it's basically quite um, expecting um, two rate hikes next year 
whereas the Fed amongst the governors are all surveyed, averages um, one, um, and then it kind of drops off, funny enough, here. So this will be quite interesting to see where this converges, right? If um, where market participants think it's going to be is around 2%, and if the 10-year, which is this right here, if we end up at around 2%, that's really not going to be that big a deal, right? I mean, end of the day, the market can deal with that. We're only talking another 30 basis points, and earnings are so strong right now, they will offset a lot of that. Problem becomes if we start getting um, further than that, and one final point before we move on, is the speed at which um, rates go up. So we've got the November um, FOMC meeting, right? Um, interestingly, it's not next week, it's the week after. So that's why next week we may get another kind of drift week, you know, where we do have another strong week. Because the market isn't dealing with um, potential of a Fed meeting. The week after will be very, very interesting. They're likely to announce officially their tapering to start at the end of the year. What will really be interesting going into 2022, there's likely to be at least one rate hike. But if, as I've mentioned, inflationary pressures persist and rates have to be um, raised a lot quicker than estimated and then the 10 year really starts to motor ahead that's going to create a big headwind um, for equity so that'll be very very interesting going into next year um, if we get a slow rate hikes obviously that suggests that the economy is growing very very nicely at a steady pace and then it's not a bad thing. Again, like I said, it, there's, we'll see how the market reacts and it will all come down to um, the speed of change. You know, if it takes a little while and it's done gradually, the market may take that positively. If it's done very, very quickly, then obviously the market's going to take that as, hey, the Fed's panicking, they're worried about inflation, they're raising rates really quickly, should we um, be worried as well? So don't think that's going to be a major issue potentially this year, but definitely next year um, it's going to be a big, big issue. So that's it in terms of... Um, you know what's been going on what i'm going to be looking at at least longer term short term next week what are we going to be looking at the only thing i believe the market will be looking at from a data calendar perspective is um, advanced gdp very very interesting um, i believe it's the first cut okay of gdp q3 gdp um, expected to come in 2.6 so, so quite weak um, on an annualized basis uh, but also earnings okay i talked about this um, have many and so many companies reporting next week but also the big um, tech companies as well Facebook Google Alphabet blah, 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 as in you know all the big ones that I mentioned so that and that okay earnings and the first cut of Q3 GDP I believe it won't matter so much even if the GDP number does come in quite weak because first it's been flagged you know the estimates are quite low Interestingly, I actually found this, um, I believe it's from the conference board, okay, so they're actually estimating a slightly higher MQ3 number of 3.5. The point is, I really wanted to understand, what is it? Why is annualized GDP on the quarter expected to drop off so much? What's actually driving that? So I found this little table, it's really interesting actually, you can see it here, right, look at that. Consumer spending, obviously we know that makes up a large part of GDP, dropping from 12% to 1%. Um, a lot of that, because obviously we know there's been a big jump in COVID cases over the quarter, the third quarter, that's obviously impacted consumer spending. We've also seen um, exports come off slightly. Uh, you know, obviously we know that um, domestically, people have had to be importing goods um, because real consumer spending, which we expect to jump back up as some of these effects of Q3 reverse. Um, and that's why, and you can even see it here actually, inventory change, right? Some of the inventory building is expected to push forward in Q4 as a lot of these effects reverse. So I think the market is not too concerned about it. So I'm not going to be too concerned about expecting a negative number or anything. So I think not much in terms of headwinds next week. Um, and that's really it. So let's get on. Hopefully that was useful for you. I'm going to quickly show you what I was doing last week, just very, very briefly going over the stats um, and then we'll be done. Okay, so you can see, hopefully you can see all of that and I'm not blocking too much of this, but you can see it was a very 
Um, and in fact, I might be blocking a little bit of that. You can see it's a rampant week, right? Value consistently shooting higher, which we talked about in the institutional Sunday last week that we're likely to get to all time highs and been talking about for a couple of weeks. So um, you can really see last week I traded three days. So uh, Friday was the best day um, and it was actually ending up looking like it wasn't going to be a great day. But um, because I did try to get into the market a couple of times and I believe there was a Fed speaker who came out and talked about um, the tapering being announced and that obviously did cause a little bit of a jitter in the market but to be honest it was just coming back to balance so it took a little short just to um, test that kind of area of balance and then bought again so those were the fields for Friday um, I can't remember whether I, I don't know if it was Thursday or not that I traded um, let's just have a very brief look um, yeah did trade on Thursday so you can see just a little um, small day for me on that day, $500 day, um, just going again with the longs, um, got shaken out a little bit by the afternoon kind of profit take, but is what it is, um, it was this day, don't know why I didn't trade, maybe I wasn't around Wednesday, Tuesday did get some longs in, um, which was really the only other day I traded, which was that day, um, so that's the whole week really, so you can see with the long bias, um, and then nothing on Monday. I think this sell-off, by the time we rallied, I was already done for the day and didn't want to chase it. The point is this. So look, most of the week, Monday didn't trade because the longs were not set up correctly for me. Um, big gap up as well. Um, so calls for concern. Didn't want to just jump in and chase it. Tuesday was a bit more of a nice setup. Um, so everything was good to go. Wednesday didn't participate. Thursday did participate. And then Friday um, got some nice trades in. I think the point is this, right? Um, the bias was set up early in the week. You saw in the institutional Sundays, I said I have a long bias this week, so I traded accordingly. I wasn't scrambling around every morning thinking, oh my God, what should I do? Play it by ear? No. Serious business, right? Got to be well prepared at the start of the week. Obviously, you can change your mind. That's absolutely fine. But, you know, be prepared for the week. You know, I always say it. Probably spent about 12, 13 hours putting the research for this together. Um, and I don't do it for you guys. I do it for myself and then obviously just happy to share. Okay, and then just finally, having a look at the month to date, um, stats have been pretty good. Obviously, it has been a little bit not as aggressive the last few sessions, if you have a look here. Right, definitely not been as aggressive. Um, but you can see here the stats so much more important than a single trade or a headline number um, yeah been pretty good 21 and a half k but the main thing is look at the mae right it's been reflective of um kind of my cautious approach recently but it doesn't matter because it's paid off in the kind of risk reward right that i've been taking and i'm not talking three to one and all this crap i hear people talking about i'm talking drawdown versus you know unit of risk how much risk are you taking in terms of drawdown versus your return okay so average winning trade um, was 1406 we're talking almost you know 200 percent there right two times unit risk um, these are the sort of things you need to be looking at not worrying about flashy screenshots and all the rest of the nonsense and just one final thing right i just want to um show you i don't know if i can do this i've uh not tried it before, I was having a look at it before, but let's see if we can compare, right, longs versus shorts, um, yeah, there you go, so for the last month, right, so whatever the number was, about 21, 22k, I can't remember, but if you have a look at my longs, 18k longs, right, and only 3.5 in shorts, so my point is 95% of my money has been made on the long side of the market. So can you see how, my point is, can you see how important it is that I have my bias, whether it's from my institutional Sunday work, my fundamental work, whether it is from, um, you know, just looking at things like market profile and just getting a feel for kind of what um, the market is doing, you know, in terms of balance, imbalance, those type of things. Um, really, really important. Um, hopefully that was useful. Hit the button to subscribe if you find this information to help. Um, and don't worry if it comes across a little bit, you know, uh, complicated or whatever it isn't, okay? It just takes a little bit of time. You've got to put the effort in and that's going to yield your results. Not looking for all that squiggly nonsense that I see people doing. 
So good luck. Can't wait to see you next week. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to be notified of this automatically. See you next week.